Mona, welcome to Fort Kochi and to this fantastic Vietnam by all accounts. <clears throat> we have the undercurrent here, the installation. Uh, much talked about, much discussed. Uh, would you like to shed some light on what undercurrents went into the making of the undercurrent? Hmm. Yes, um, I often make work that are based on everyday objects um, that uh, we encounter in our everyday life, but I transform them in such a way they become either uh, unusable or maybe even um, dangerous or threatening. In this case, it's a work called Undercurrent, um, and it's um, basically based on a mat or a carpet, which is woven out of um, a cloth-covered electric uh, cable. So this is the kind of cable you usually see at, on, on the domestic iron, you know, so it's, it's covered in cloth. And it's woven into this uh, central square mat, which then has a, a very long fringe where the, the cables spill out into the space, invading the space, and each cable ends with a light bulb that, that um, has the light in it fluctuating up and down, so it uh, dims and um, brightens rhythmically as if it's breathing. So in a sense this inanimate object has become something like a, uh, a creature of some kind that has invaded the space a bit like a medusa um, kind of creature that has invaded the space and also um, there's something quite satisfying about the fact that the square in the middle which is very geometric, it's a grid and a rigid kind of structure has grown into something very organic and has sort of invaded the space and in a sense it gives you this feeling, uh, it's an unnerving feeling of feeling that there is electricity under your feet sort of thing. Um, and it's, on, the one, on the other hand it makes you reflect on the fact that everything around us, even the solid ground, is not actually uh, you know, inanimate, it's actually teeming with energy um, on the atomic level. So it could th make you think about kind of, you know, how the space around you is alive. <coughs> Some of the works which we sh showed yesterday also displayed a, a similar fascination with what about the dangers. Yeah. Is it a recurring uh, motif uh, in your work? Um, well, often in the work I, I, I create, there is a sense of threat. There is a, a like. A, like pointing out the, the fact that things are not necessarily what they seem to be, but a kind of uh, giving people a way of sort of looking at the reality and questioning everything around them, and questioning the solidity of the ground under, uh, that they're walking on. So it's, it's a kind of uh, destabilizing the space to make you feel that uh, things are not necessarily what they seem to be, to, to have this kind of questioning attitude towards everything around you. You spoke about the uh, ambivalence yesterday in your right. talk. Uh, to what extent does ambivalence uh, define uh, your work? Uh, is it central to your craft? Well, ambivalence in the sense that a lot of the work um, can push and pull you in two different directions. It can be very seductive at the same time it can be dangerous. Um, something that, um, you know, a work that I called uh, The Light at the End, for instance, from a distance it looks like bars of light. And then when you get close to it, you realize that those bars are made of electric heating elements. So the whole perception changes and puts you in an ambivalent situation of feeling attracted to this um, heat, at the same time feeling repelled by it. So there's like attraction repulsion happening. So the ambivalence is something more like, like exposing contradictions in every situation, having, if you like, the positive and the negative existing right in the same instant, if you like. You know. So this is the kind of ambivalence I like to explore. You referred to politics yesterday, and how art is possibly political. Uh, is art a political act? I think for each work of art, it, I mean, it's a result of a set of ideas, an ideology. So, 
every work reflects the position of the artist, if you like. But whether the art language is really the most suitable language for articulating very specific political positions and trying to uh, present an argument and convince people about your, your side of the argument, if you like, I'm not sure that art is the most um, uh, suitable language for that, because art itself is very slippery, the form of art can be very abstract, like um, if somebody was making a documentary, for instance, or using the written language to convince people about certain arguments, that might actually work. But if I'm talking about my own work, where I really like to articulate these ideas through the form, uh, through the, you know, the, um, the aesthetic, the visual aspect of the work, all I'm producing is certain sensations or certain things that make people feel that the ground is shifting under their feet or that things are not as solid as they think or the fact that there is an undercurrent of hostility inside an object therefore the environment they're in is not necessarily to be trusted. So just uh, creating some sensations if you like that make people question the world they inhabit but I'm not sure if it's possible to actually articulate something in a very specific way, you know, dealing with very specific areas of the world or specific conflict or, you know, specific political position. I think that's uh, probably much harder to do in an art than in film or literature or, <laughs> you know, other forms of expression. Does the idea of uh, exile play a role in your work? Well, I, I'm, not, um, I'm not interested in actually illustrating uh, concepts like exile or... Um, okay. I don't set out to actually speak about specific things like exile, uh, displacement, but the fact that this is actually my own experience sort of seeps into the work but in a very indirect way as I said uh, using you know uh, light and shadows for instance in one installation I made destabilizes the ground you're walking on it makes you feel that the whole space is shifting around you and that could be the sensation of someone who is in exile who has to um, you know exist in a culture that is foreign and that's not maybe as welcoming as uh, they expect so these things are articulated on that level in a very kind of uh, subtle and formal and phenomenological way in the installations. So, in other words, um, uh, I don't set out to speak about exile, but very often after I've made the work, I reflect on it and I think, oh, well, this could be seen as some the experience of the exile or the experience of a displaced person um, of some kind, you know, and it doesn't have to be someone coming from, uh, you know, Lebanon to London, it could be someone who is from the countryside and ends up in the city, you know, so it could be exile or displacement on many different levels. One final question. <clears throat> what are those intersections uh, you as an artist look at between the aesthetic of art and uh, the, the, the compulsions of life? Or the conflicts of life. <laughs> Sorry, I don't understand. The intersections between the aesthetic of art and the conflicts of life. Uh, where, does it, where do they converge? Where do they converge? In the work. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, uh, everything that uh, an artist does is the result of their experience in the world and their makeup and the way they view the world around them. So. As far as I'm concerned, all these things are intersecting all the time. I don't think I... I think we should give yes. up this question. <laughs> Forget it. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you very much. If you don't much. mind, because I don't... Okay.